Hello everyone, welcome to the Melting Pot podcast. I'm your host Dominic Monkhouse. The Melting Pot is as a result of my hunger for optimizing business performance, scaling up organizations, corporate culture, customer addiction, building high performing teams, along with a few other obsessions along the way. I've spent the last several years working for and with some of the most successful top performing companies in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you build a high quality business and live a more fulfilling life. If you enjoy the podcast, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at dominicmonkhouse.com. Today I'm talking to David Hyatt. He's the CEO of Hyatt Denim and the co-founder of the Do Lectures. And I'm absolutely delighted he said yes when I asked him if he'd uh, jump on and do a podcast interview with me. He was the founder of Howie's, uh, a brand that I liked and admired, which he sold to Timberland in 2007, I think. And the Do Lectures is, there's some fantastic content. It's, It's the Welsh version of TED Talks. It's people in a cow shed telling the amazing stories of things that they've done. And we talk a bit about that and why he's done that. And we talk about his business high at Denham and and how he has a purpose there. He lives in Cardigan in West Wales, and that used to be the town that made the most jeans in Britain. And then the jeans factory closed and potentially a million pounds a week went out of the local economy. And he lives there. That's his home. He moved there when he was with Howie's. And now he's got a jeans factory again, making jeans. The people who make the jeans are called grandmasters. They're craftsmen, 10, 20, 30 years worth of, you know, 10, 20,000 hours of skill. And we talk about building that business and how he's built it and what marketing techniques he's used and what the future holds. And then I'll link in the show notes to the documentary that they did uh, a little while ago, which was, uh, you know, moving back into the new factory and creating heart and soul back in the business. And then last year, they got really lucky. Meghan Markle wore a pair of their jeans and all of a sudden they had a three month waiting list. So we talk about what that was like and and how we managed to capitalize on the luck that they got last year. So great conversation. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. My name's uh, David Hyatt, and I'm a co-founder of Hyatt Denim, and also co-founder of the Do Lectures. And I work uh, pretty much with in everything I do with my wife Claire. So um, any of the good bits that we do are probably coming from her, really, as <laughs> uh, she often reminds me. <laughs> you've had a you've had a fantastic year in the denim business. I mean, every year is fantastic, but last year particularly, you've yeah, no, you know, I mean sometimes you work really hard and you wonder if you're ever going to get some luck. And I think pretty much every business needs that little lucky break, that little moment that takes you and introduces you to the world. And we had that moment last year. And I mean, essentially Prince Harry and and Meghan Markle visited Wales and, and she wore our jeans and we didn't really have to spend too much on marketing last year. (laughs) (laughs) Did you know she bought the jeans before she appeared on TV in them or social media in them? We knew uh, like she had a pair, but we didn't know until, well, actually, we only found out when the, you know, the Daily Telegraph phoned up and said, um, you know, can you confirm that Meghan Markle is wearing your jeans? And I was going, oh, uh, wow, yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a cool phone call. Um, so we found out like everybody else. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's great for the factory and it's great for the grandmasters because not often do the makers get celebrated and not often do the, the spotlights shine on them. They're doing something highly skilled but highly repetitive every day. And and it, and it was nice for them and the team to like have the spotlight and the world's media come to them for a couple of crazy months. And it was like, as moments come, it was a defining moment, so. And so just to, just to pick up on that, the, you call the people in the factory the, who make the jeans grandmasters and that's your tribute to them and, and their skill? Malcolm Gladwell, um, in his Outlier book, said that to be a grandmaster at chess, you have to do 10,000 hours. And 
I don't think he invented that term, but you know, he made it popular. But the grandmasters in the factory have been doing it for 30, 40, 50, and in some cases, like 50,000 hours. So they're like grandmasters plus. And I just, I just wanted them, I mean, you have to think back, like the old factory was, they were asked the question, how fast could you make a gene? And I wanted to ask them a question, how good can you make a gene? And so I wanted to, them to know that, um, you know, we're making genes, but, you know, we're now making Aston Martins. I wanted them to think differently and I wanted them to change, like, how they thought about themselves. Pride, quality. Uh, you do that series in, the, in your newsletter, the a thing, one thing made well. Yeah. Are you there? Is that, does that reflect the passion that you have? and a liking of products and brands that, that are where somebody specializes in something? Or is that sort of... I think when somebody does something well, I, I guess because I know how hard it is to do something, even one thing, extraordinary well. Like if you want to be the best at karate, you have to kick 30,000 times. And it's no accident. And so I kind of just have that respect for people who, who decide that they want to be good at something. And, you know, like, it's a ball ache. You have to do it so repetitively and, like, and for years. And so, like, I just, from a point of respect, I'm going to, like, to do one thing well. Like, people go, oh, that's you taking the easy way. You're just going to do one thing and do that. Like, that's such a big ambition because it's 10 years to get good at it. It's another 10 years to get great at it. It really is um, a thing. Why are you in the jeans business? Why are you trying to sell handmade jeans to people? To give everyone the backstory in case they, they don't know it. You know, we live in Cardigan in West Wales. I mean, we're literally closer to Ireland than to Cardiff. <laughs> but for a very odd reason, and I don't actually know the real reason, is it had Britain's biggest jeans factory. And for 40 years, it made 35,000 pairs of jeans a week. Uh, and then in 2002, that factory closed and, and like 400 world-class makers had nothing to make. And we had to wait 10 years for the, this remarkable thing to happen called the internet. But we wanted to know, is it possible to get those 400 people their jobs back? I mean, is that just like a crazy dream? And because this town knows how to do that one thing extraordinarily well. And, you know, like, God, what was the point in learning the skills if we were literally going to throw them away and you know the economics change and uh, that happens and but then suddenly the internet meant that the economics changed back and so we're in the right town at the right time with the right people with the right skills and people out there actually they fell back in love with quality and this throwaway culture of didn't feel that good to everybody and and suddenly there was a, a falling back in love with quality. And, and so it, all those things, you know, that, you know whether, you, whether that's a zeitgeist or just luck or, you know, something happened in that time where you could go, God, we, the economics works. You know, there's desire from a customer for excellence. And the whole thing had changed everywhere. I mean, from coffee, oh, let's have bad coffee. Actually, let's not have bad coffee anymore. Let's have good coffee. And once you've had good coffee, you can't go back to bad coffee. And, and then craft beer came and you go, God, what were we drinking before? And, and so there's that thing of just going, God, like, yeah, you know, we can't make a very fast gene, but God, we can make a really, really good gene. And that gravity towards quality had come back. Um, you know, there's a lot of luck in that. Jim Collins in, uh, says that the return on luck Bet great companies don't have more luck or less luck, but they manage to capitalize on the luck that comes their way. I think that's true. You know, we were in the right place. We got lucky, you know, obviously with, you know, Meghan Markle actually wanting to use her fame to shine a light on, you know, small people, you know, got lucky there. But, but uh, you know, we delivered. I mean, uh, the genes fit like a glove. We took advantage of the luck because we got the basics. You know, we'd spent a year an entire year working on one cut of jeans, so it was right. When the moment came, we took the moment. Yeah. Why did you feel that it was your challenge to 
create create a jeans business again. I mean, you've got you've had a clothing business before. Did you want another one? Not want another one? It's odd, right? Because we're back in the same place that I left. So, and when I walked down the twenty seven steps, I was going like, literally, I'm not ever coming back to this building i'm done and i definitely didn't want to run around the same track twice i'm going well i've done clothing obviously i wrote a plan and but i put it on a shelf for a year because i just to be honest i I had felt like a bit defeated after you know like most people they build a business and sell it and they view that as success i actually felt the opposite i felt there was a lot of failure in that because i'm going actually patagonia owned their company and didn't sell it and and I felt like the, the job was half done. So, you know, like to answer your question, you know, two things that we did particularly well at Howie's was like Merino base layers. We were pretty damn good at that. And we made a great pair of jeans. The interesting thing was when you go, well, actually, it wasn't really about me. It was about, could I get the town making jeans again? So they had the ability to make, and I knew how to go and build something, a brand, and therefore I had the ability to sell. And you know, in terms of, you know, they were the left leg and I was the right leg. And you know, which one takes you forward and which one's more important than the other? Well, if you can make and can't sell, no point. And if you can sell and can't make, no point. So we completely complemented each other. And that's quite rare. I mean, it's quite rare. You go, those people have those skills. We have another set of skills. And, and the internet happened to allow those skills to be viable. Did you sort of feel compelled to, you know, you're walking down the high street in Cardigan and you think it would be better if this town was a bit more prosperous and, and, I, and I could do something about it, so I should. When a small town loses its biggest employer, there's, it's a knock, it's a dent. And, you know, you know like, just like the rest of us, if we have, you know, if we lose a job, we lose confidence. Um, and I think the town not only lost 400 people, their jobs went away. Um, they also lost part of their identity. It was a maker town. Then all of a sudden it didn't make. You know, the pubs closed, shops closed. You know, it, you know there's a figure which I, I never really found out if it's true or not, but like the equivalent of a million pounds going out of the economy a week. For a small town, it's a big thing. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in... Yeah, and myself and Claire both grew up in you know the South Wales mining valleys. And you know, like when I went to school one day, the miners were on my left. When I come back, you know, the miners were on my right. In the morning, they had clean faces, and in the afternoon shift, they had dirty faces. And but then one day, they weren't there. They literally had lost their jobs, and but like that it took the community away. So maybe there's that thing of if you feel like you could do something and and you don't do it, then. I wonder how you would feel at the end of your life. So I mean, I think there was a, a deep thing, and uh, you know, for me personally, I'm going. Oh, I felt battered and bruised after, you know, the Howie's thing, and you know, like, so I wasn't like hell bent. I've had 15 rounds, feeling knackered. Let's go back in the, let's go back <laughs> again, because it's a hard thing starting a factory. Never done it before. Everybody makes in China for a reason because it's cheaper. Would people really want to make jeans again? Starting a brand from nothing with no marketing budget, really. So uh, we we definitely doing hard things, and you know we didn't want to go and raise a ton of venture capital, although we could have because we had a certain track record with, which would give them some comfort. So we were not only doing hard things, but we wanted to do them harder because of certain ways that we wanted to do the business. And, um, and, and, you know, the first three years were hard. I was customer service. I was, you know, sending parcels out. I'm pretty rubbish at that. Packing boxes, you know, like trying to find things to air compressors for factories I never knew anything about. I spent the first three years just Googling, like, how do you run a factory? Like, why? I mean, next question, why would you want to run a factory? I mean, the good thing about entrepreneurs is they have that naivety of not actually working out how hard it's going to be. I think if they actually worked out how hard it was, <laughs> I don't think anybody started any businesses. <laughs> and that optimism, unbridled optimism. It'll be all right. We'll get there in the end. Literally going to be fine. 
So can I take you back to the, uh, before we dive into how did you build your business with no marketing budget, can we go and talk about the Howie's journey? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so where, where did, how, did that, how did that start? Take us through that journey. I'll try and do this as quickly as possible, but as a kid, I mean, my bedroom, apart from the door handles and the windows, because my mum wouldn't allow it, was covered in posters. And that would be Adidas, you know, Nike, Puma, you know, like Levi's, Wrangler. I mean, anybody who would send me a poster, I would literally, even the ceiling was done. I loved brands and I, I have no idea why. It just, I just thought, God, how cool is to have one of those? And so at 16, I said my dad shouldn't really do A-levels. I'm not that bright. And he lent me half his savings. And um, you know, within six months, I'd lost all the money. Um, and he, he said, well, what did you learn? I said, well, I learned I really loved it. He said, well, the next lesson has to be learn how to be good at it. And that would be a journey of nearly 30 years to try and work that one out. Um, so I went back to do my A-levels, did it in a year, went to college, got thrown out, uh, spent a year and a half on the dole eating you know, beans on toast, uh, got a job finally at you know, the world's most creative ad agency at the time, Saatchi and Saatchi, age 21, couldn't spell, thought you know, like a colon was a disease, I thought a semicolon was a complication of the <laughs> disease, and I was employed as a writer. I'm going, oh my God. Up until that point, I was reading like the shoot magazine, football magazine, and um, fortunately, Claire, my wife introduced me to a thing, a new concept called books. So I started reading a lot of those. And the turning point at Sarchi's was uh, Louis Dreyfus at the time was our CEO. And he decided one day he came in and said, I'm going to buy Adidas. And I'm going, he was already, you know, wearing jeans. He was smoking a cigar. He was going out with Kim Bastion. And, but the thing I thought was most cool about him was he's literally going to buy Adidas. And actually he did. And I think, you know, like Saatchi and Saatchi pitched for it, but I think something happened between you know, Charles and Morris. I, I, I was you know, never high enough in, in Saatchi and Saatchi to know actually what happened, but they had had a falling out and actually, you know, consequence of it, of it was Saatchi didn't win the pitch. And I spent six months on the pitch and I'm going, God, even if we'd wrote Just Do It and Nike hadn't done it, we wouldn't have won it, I don't think. So I then, I then went to work for the company that did win the pitch and and that was Liga Slaney and a guy who's founder of the, the company I mean I didn't particularly get on with him he's a, like an amazing writer but everything I wrote he would turn down it was like I kept writing ads and like nothing like nothing would get through and actually but I had a real feel for Adidas I knew like I knew what it should do but he all he wanted to do was ape um, Nike so all the ads that I got turned down, there was a certain voice there. And that voice you know, was the Howie's voice. So from him turning everything down, got me to the point go, well, actually, there should be a, a brand out there with this voice. And that's how I started Howie's. What was Howie's for those people that don't know it? So Howie's was like a, an action sports clothing brands, you know, like mountain bikers, skateboarders, BMXers, and... And that actually, its, it's ethos was to try and you know, make you think as well as buy, and that was the really interesting aspect to it. It was, you know, it was a brand that had lots of questions, and it wasn't telling you what the answer was. Going, hey, maybe we should think about work differently. Maybe we should think about money differently. And actually, it really had a like real amazing following, and uh, it got voted in the top fifty brands in in the UK, and and all sorts of crazy things and yet we spent diddly squat on marketing and you sold uh you sold waterproof jeans for commuting in amongst other amongst other things yeah we, we just tried to put ideas into it and it was kind of it was a really interesting company trying to do interesting things and you know like patagonia you now do footprint chronicles because of something we wrote or i wrote at howie's about the journey of a carrot so it had a lot of influence. I and mean, actually, when we went to sell, because actually we literally had never run a business before and, you know, we were growing too fast and we thought growth was good. And But what we should have done if we'd run a business before is to slow the growth down. And we just didn't know at the time. But we had Japan's 
richest guy who owns Uniqlo. He wanted to buy a company called PPR, which is now called Karen, who owned Gucci, Yves Laurent, at the time, Stella McCartney, and Puma. They'd identified two brands in the world that they wanted to buy. One was Quicksilver and one was Howie's. And, you know, even we were talking to Patagonia, could we do something? And at the time, it wasn't right for them. And so we had a lot of people like, and Steve Case, who started AOL, offered us $30 million to move to California and, and do the brand out there. But we chose to stay in Cardigan and, and you know, we, we just moved there with our young family and we'd done something right. We didn't yeah. really know how to run a business. We had to do that apprenticeship, but we'd done something right. And so what, so who, who bought it in the end? Timberland bought it in the end. And uh, I think it was just poor time in, you know, like, you know, it was around 2008. The world was in a bit of a rocky shape. Actually, I didn't know at the time, but they were trying to sell themselves. And so they really went concentrating on us. And I sort of felt like, well, actually, why do we sell in the first place if, if you're not going to either give us any attention? And we sold so we could get some investment. But actually, you know, Timberland were very busy looking after Timberland, as they should do. I get that. Is it still part of Timberland? Did it? No, Timberland then sold to VF and VF own, you know, North Face and various companies. So VF were really interested in Timberland, didn't really want to have a little small brand in West Wales. So I think that one of the Timberland executives then went and bought it and it's still going. It's just, and they've sort of moved out of town and cut their roots a bit, really. So, yeah. So you've got that sort of advertising story into Howie's. You've got the learn to build a business, sell it, and then this sort of drive to create a new business, but you've got, you've got no money. Where, where is the business on the, the jeans business now on its journey? Where have you, where have you got to? I mean, does it make sense to say how many people, how much revenue, or is it? It's still a very small business. I mean, I mean, part of the thing that we took from how he's going to write, let's, let's make sure the economics work. Um, you know, so, you know, we've been profitable for the you know, last four or five years in a row. I mean, as much as we want to grow, we're also going, we don't want to grow so fast. It makes us vulnerable. We turned over just over a million pounds last year. We grew 10%. You know, we could have done a half million pounds worth more if we moved factory earlier. I mean, the demand was you know, much more than we could cope with. But I'm there going, well, you know, make a great gene. We'll grow, but we want to grow so we make ourselves vulnerable. And I'm sort of a great believer in the power of the compound effect, where you go, don't be worried that it's small now because we're just going to grow. And the thing I ask the team is, we're going to grow our influence because if we do that, you know, the sales will come. The companies that chase the sales, they go very high and then they die. We grow our influence and we'll grow our sales. Yeah. So you quite an emotional moment moving, moving factories. There was a lot to it, you see, because like we were going back to the place where the grandmasters used to make jeans. I mean, literally within five yards of where they used to make jeans and and so for them, it was like an emotional return. And also, so upstairs is where we run Howie's from. So that was an emotional return. And, and actually, we went to see lots of places around the area. And I was kind of like going, I'm not sure what the energy will be like if we went back there. So I was trying everywhere else. And then, um, then when somebody said, look, yeah, you, you literally know where we should go, don't you? And I went, well, where, where all the infrastructure is for a, a jeans factory. So I took the team down there and I said, look, do you feel like the job is we didn't finish the mission last time? Because I felt that about Howie's. And do you feel that about the old factory? Because if the energy is like, let's go and finish the mission now, let's come back here and get it done. And actually the energy was going, yeah, okay, we're going to go back and, and this time we'll complete the mission. And, and completing the mission is, yes, go and build a very strong global brand and for me that is also the mission and but also to be of influence you know the, the way we work you know, how low impact we are all those things and so that was good energy and it's really important for a team to go you know like you want to be like having to motivate people motivation is needed when actually you know the purpose isn't defined yeah 
and it's a re- you've got that really clear, really clear purpose. I f- it's funny, I feel the same way about sales commission. If you've got salespeople who are selling a good product, which is really right for the customer, why would you pay them commission to do that? They would just want to do that anyway. That does tend to generate hate mail from sales directors, but no. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you started the business, no marketing, but I, I know the answer to the question because you turned it into a course and a book. What, how have you grown the business to the point you're at now? I'll give you some context. I mean, when we started, um, we had a lot of press because mostly because manufacturing goes away and it very rarely ever comes back. So once a factory leaves the, you know, the UK, it's really odd that it would come back because the economics are such you know, that you know, it's always cheaper to make, make elsewhere. So we got a lot of press. And so in the first month of starting, like we had six months worth of orders. And I'm like, going, oh my gosh, that's gone pretty well. And bad problems are, 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 you know, have to be sorted, but nice problems have to be sorted too. And for some reason, I thought the most sensible thing would be to close the website stop taking orders and go and hire some more people and actually go and get those good people who've ordered and trusted us to make jeans for them. Go and get those people all happy. And that's what we did. And we really got, you know, like we just got our heads down, got the work done and got those jeans to all those good people. And when we finally did that, I said, right, let's go and open the website. And you put the website back up and, you know, this extraordinary thing happened and that was nothing. (laughs) <laughs> like I was like, uh, and so we made all the jeans for our customers and we obviously knew that they were going to last a long time because we made them incredibly well and used the best materials on the planet. Um, so they weren't going to be in a rush to come back and have some more. And it was in that moment where I gone like, and I'd just taken, you know, on another five people and you know, like suddenly, you know, you, at the end of the month, you've got to pay everybody. And I'm going, suddenly there's no orders. And, and that was our sort of moment where I sat down and gone, right. I spent all the, the marketing budget on the coffee machine and, and the nice wood surround in the, in the factory. The factory looked lovely. And I was there going, cracky, uh, I literally need to think. And I think, yeah, sometimes having a real crisis really makes you edit suddenly be, things become very clear. And I, I, at that moment of clarity, I'm going to write, I literally have to go and build our newsletter because that is our way to effectively and cheaply talk to our customers. But we have to understand that we can't have a relationship where we just sell. And, and so uh, you know, from the start, we're going like, we have to give, we have to be useful, we have to inspire. And then now and again, when we have something to sell, we'll sell. And that became our absolute priority. Everything that we did, you know, we'd go and build lists of makers and mavericks. We'd build lists of do one thing well. And in the newsletters, we'd divide them up into like, you know, we'd have one to inspire, then one to sell, one to inspire, then one to sell. It was, and I wrote all that strategy in five minutes. And actually nothing much has changed, but we, we've done it so reliably I mean, and we've invested in trying to find stuff that people hadn't found. And, and so actually the newsletter became our number one tool to speak to our customer and we weren't always selling. And that strategy of like, give them some inspiration, give them some usefulness, give them something. And then when you have something to sell, sell. But I think the best relationships are where you give. And, you know, if you think about a friend, you know, we all have people like friends who call us and you literally see, when you see their name on the phone, you go, oh my God, what's he <laughs> want now? Like, and that's what most brands are like. You know, like, oh, what do they want now? Rather than just go, hey, I wonder what they're going to, maybe they got a really good book recommendation or they've seen a funny film. So you take the call from a friend who you know is just going to phone up and like make you laugh. Or, you know, it's going to say, hey, I've seen this great play. You should go and see it. And I thought that's the relationship we should be in. And, and everybody wants more followers. But, you know, nobody, like, wants to listen. And, you know, nobody wants to give. And I just thought, God, if we think like that, if we think differently, then I think we have a chance. To create some 
create some relationships and get some long-term sales. Yeah, and it's worked. I mean, you know, our newsletter, the open rate is beyond, you know, three, four times more than the industry standard. I mean, it's, you know, but we work very hard at it. We invest a lot of time into try and find out great stuff to share, or we invest in trying to write it well or make sure it looks good. And, and yet, I mean, the brilliant thing is, and this is like an important thing, it's like most companies don't care about newsletters. And actually that is the opportunity because regardless of how, we, how much we love Instagram and how much we love you know, or maybe not so much love, you know, with Facebook or Twitter or, you know, Google, the number one way to speak to a customer and to have their attention is a newsletter. You've written that up as a book. I can't remember what the name is. What's the title of that book? Um, it's called Do Open. And Do it's Open. By, you know, yeah, and it's, it's by the, the Do Book Company. And, but I didn't actually particularly want to write a book. I went to Amazon. I'm going, I, I much prefer if somebody else had written the book because like, otherwise, you know, it's like a bunch of time. And so I went there and I bought, I was going, God, there's about three books about newsletters. Going, that's a big choice. I mean, Amazon has tons about anything. But like newsletters, there was nothing. And I bought one. And you know when sometimes like a photocopier is running out of ink, you can half read it and half not. And this book was like that. I'm going, nobody gives a shit about this thing. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it's the number one way to go and grow your business. And like, nobody cares because all the other things out there are far. Nobody from newsletters gets on the front page of Wired. Like nobody from newsletters gets on the front page of Fast Company. So nobody's given it any attention. And what's happened is like a lot of people are not very good at it. Yes. You get, I mean, I, I think of um, win friends and influence people. You know, nobody cares about you. They only care about themselves. And you get newsletters from companies that are all about them. Look at all of this amazing stuff that we're doing. And it's like, I don't really care about what you're doing. You know, give me something. Help me do what I'm doing. Yeah. And uh, the, the interesting thing, so there's, from a brand point of view, if you want it, there's two ways to do it. Like there's, this is all about us. Uh, we're a running company, we make running shoes, this is how to run better, fine. That, that's going to help a particular part of my life. But that part of my life is only 10% of my life. And, and so you can be very narrow in a very focused area and we're going to get that 10%. And, and, and that's a very effective strategy. You know, Nike have done it, Rafa have done it. But it's a good strategy and it works. But there's another strategy where it's... Um, I'm going to see the entire human being and I'm going to talk to you as if there's more to you than that 10%. And I think that's another strategy. And I think for some, that's a really brilliant strategy. Yeah. And so you did, you published the book via Do Publishing, which is part of the Do Lectures, which at the beginning you said you're a co-founder of that. So, I mean, actually Miranda is, it's her company. She, in, owns it all. But I left Howie's and for that year where I didn't know what to do, I'd written the Hyatt plan, but I put it on the shelf. I thought I'll go and start a book company because we got the do lectures. I'll... Then after about a year, I literally turned around and go like, I know nothing about books. <laughs> like I read them. And a week later, Miranda phone up said, have you ever thought about doing um, the do book company? I'm going, I'll send you the PDF. <laughs> And anyway, so it's her company. She pays a royalty to the Do Lectures, and it's a great relationship. She really knows the book world. She's incredible, and she's very inspiring, and it's a great relationship. But I said to her, I said, look, you won't have any problems getting um, authors because you've already got all people from the Do Lectures. You know, and the rule was you have to get people from the Do Lectures. You know, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And then, of course, she asked me then, go, well, Dave, you're going to have to write a book. I'm going, oh, what? Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize that was the plan. Because uh, I, I didn't, I'm a, like a reluctant writer. I mean, I find it really hard to write. And so, like, I can't spell. I'm dyslexic. And Claire's going, God, your grammar's terrible. She's going, like, I can't believe you're a writer. I'm going, no, me. I can't. Yeah. You know, so writing a book isn't, like, number one on my list. But I also knew that 
there was something there because actually, you know, that market wasn't well served. And so if I could put it across, I'd, I learned a ton how to get really good at it. So, and I just thought, well, I'll, I'll put that down. It then became a book. It then became a workshop. And in September, it's going to become like an online workshop. It's mad. I mean, it was only because it, nobody had really done it well. Um, but you wrote another book, didn't you? Yeah, I wrote um, Do Purpose. <laughs> <laughs> that was a book I actually wanted to write because I feel for me, the best brands in the world exist to go and change something. And and as a byproduct, of that, you know, they are incredible businesses as well. And And if you think about, I don't know, Apple in the early days, they were fighting to make things simpler. And actually we all wanted them to win. You know, Patagonia fights on behalf of the environment and, and we want them to win. And, and when companies exist for a bigger purpose than just the founder, I think that's when business becomes really interesting. I thought Let Your People Go Surfing was just incredible and wished, and by the time I read it, I, I realised that I wished I'd read it 10 years before. Yeah, no, actually, you can ask me, but, you know, what books will I recommend and that will be one of them. And, but I mean, I think Patagonia have put their values into the company and try to use their business to make change in this world. And, and I think that's the opportunity for all founders. And I spoke to uh, Yvonne on the on the phone before I started Hyatt and because I'd been sending him the catalogs for years and I never heard anything from him but I, I kind of knew that it was you know how he's had influenced um, Patagonia in some way and I just said oh I was, you know thanks for taking the phone call and I just wanted to ask you because before I set out on this thing is how did you keep hold of Patagonia because like business is you know it's a tough old game actually and he said, oh, well, you know, it was, you know, he's a very cool guy. Um, he's going, well, it was 40 years hard work. And I'm going, ah, I knew it. I knew it. And then, and then, and then he said, oh, yeah, and two remortgages. And I'm going, oh, I knew it. So, yeah, that book is a great instrument, a great user manual for people to go and, like, run a business that should exist, that matters in this world. And also... Yeah. You know, to look after the people, you know, the team. And it's not just a great read. It's like you have to read it and then go and implement it into your business. And what, for the people who don't know, what, what are the do lectures? And why, why do they exist? Well, you know, like a funny thing is I got invited by Patagonia to their tools camp. And because, you know, we'd done a lot of stuff with Howie's and, you know, they we'd help them and they'd helped us and, so I got invited. They did a tools camp every two years, and that was to go and help people be better at communicating their cause to their tribe, their audience. And, and it's only eight to 80 people, so it's a great honor to be asked. But at the time, like things were going a bit crazy at Howie's, and I literally couldn't get there. And I said, well, don't worry. I'll, um, I'll watch them on, online, because that was just becoming a thing. And, and they said, oh, we don't record it. And I'm going, really? Uh, I thought, God, that's crazy. Maybe, maybe the opportunity is to go and do something like that, but record it so the world can see it. And at the same time, uh, Tony Davison, who's a uh, you know, creative director of Wyden Candy uh, and a good mate, sent me a text and it was you know, like something along the lines of, you know, don't just stand there, do something dick dastardly. And that evening, myself and Claire over dinner, was just kind of, wow, actually... Patagonia doing this and and yet the world can't see only 80 people get that nutrition and actually like the people who inspire us to go and do things have done great things and and so it was all about doing and and, and you know, could God, can we just learn from those people those role models and um, you know the do lectures was only ever meant to be like a one-off gig you know, there's no plan there's no business plan I mean like um, but we kind of set the thing of oh we'll do it and we'll do it once and and then unless it's completely and utterly brilliant we'll never do it again ever and so you know each conference it was like oh my god it's brilliant again uh, you know what that means and, and now it's become its own thing and 
Maggie Dine's talk recently got Goldcast uh, phoned us up and said, can we use your talk and put it on our website? And we're going, our thing is to get the talks out to as many people and places as possible. And there's no advertising on, on the site. It's not trying to do that thing. But the interesting thing is like Maggie Dine's talk then went on to have 90 million views and a million shares. And it's the second most popular talk on Goldcast. And we're in West Wales in a small town. You know, the talks take place in a, a, a cow shed. And, you know, suddenly you go, God, you can be small and massive. And that's an interesting concept. It goes to the thing you said earlier about not necessarily scaling revenue, but scaling influence. Yes. Small but influential. Oh, completely. And you know, we, you know, we make jeans for Rennie Rossetti at Noma. And I think there was a story I read about him was, um, you know, there was one April rainy day and they had 25, 30 people in there all day. And then, you know, the same people with the same talent, two years later, there was two and a half thousand people on the waiting list. And the difference was not his talent or his energy or his enthusiasm was, it was how influential he'd become because he won an award. The award was, which is pretty handy, the world's best chef. He had suddenly gained influence. And that, you know, that, that's part of the story I tell to the team for us and go look, once we gain influence, you won't have to worry about the sales because the sales will come. And I'm like, I don't mind being a nice 10 million pound, amazing global denim brand. If it's a global denim brand that sells 10 million pounds, but has huge influence. So your size and the size of your company and in terms of your turnover, that's one way to measure success. Another metric is how much of an influence do you play in this world? Can you, as a small company, go and change an entire industry? And people do. When I saw Chef's Table on Netflix, you go, that series has changed how every other food series now plays out. It was so, so much of an influence. I mean, it was so like taking something and doing something in a very different way. And suddenly it gets quoted Go, oh, we want the chef's table but about jeans or whatever it is. I think especially small companies and purpose-driven companies, if they chase influence, I think they'll have a lot more sales. Yeah. Is there one thing, if you went back in time, is there one thing you know now that you would like to take back with you in time? I think the thing that I perhaps didn't know when you're in your 20s and you're in a rush is the importance of like the compound effect of what you do. So it doesn't matter if things start out small. People think they want instant results. They want the instant big win and, and they therefore don't persevere. But I, I think, God, if they really knew, if they just kept going at that single thing, how big it could become. And people run out of patience. They kind of want the big win or the you know like but actually big wins are rare and so the one thing i had le learned is the importance of coming in learning how to be better than you were yesterday and doing that relentlessly because uh, like everybody wants to win the lottery but actually the person who wins the lottery is just lucky actually if you i was reading a book called the compound effect and they said if you um if you recorded uh, a 30 second interview with everybody who lost the lottery, you know, say last week, it would take nine days to play. <laughs> nine days. And, and so, but there's only one winner and yet all those people didn't win, but we all gravitate towards that. Oh, I want to win the lottery. You go, well, the odds are you're not ever going to do it. But if you came in and, and said, oh, I'm going to be 1% better today than I was yesterday, and you do that for you know like an entire year, you're probably going to be 40 times better than you were at the end of the year than at the start. And I don't think we understand the power either, not just in money terms, but the in reputation, in terms of voice, you know, building a brand, patience. I don't think we understand 
the enormous potential of the compound effect where you come in and you grow this little thing. I, I think we quit on our things too early because they don't give us the reward. But to give you another example, like if I gave you say 3 million pounds or if I gave you the option of doubling a penny every day for a month, you know, everybody knows this story is at the end of the month, you end up with much more money than you, know, you end up with 10 million pounds or something. But it's only in the last two or three days that the money changes from, you know, like, you know, you're still, you know, if I give you that three million pounds up until the last three or four days, you still be there going, man, I made the, the smart move. You know, compound interest, compound effect takes place over a long period of time. And, and we're too easy to quit on our ideas. And human, human beings seem to be hardwired to not be able to perceive anything other than linear change, that sort of exponential thing, I think we, we seem poor at. That's what I've learned, where you suddenly go, God, we, we expect a big result real quick and, and get disappointed when one doesn't come. But you get good at something over a long period of time. And yeah. yes, you know, the, the lottery winner makes attention because the person who has suddenly has a million views on YouTube gets attention because they're actually very, very rare. Yeah. And we, we want that thing and you go, oh, that's bit, it gets attention because it's not normal. The normal thing is you work at something and after 10 years, you're an overnight success. That's <laughs> normal. That's the normal thing. So, yeah, so I've learned that, you know, like persistence and doing something each and every day and pushing it a bit further each and every day over time gives you incredible results thank you for that what um what books would you recommend what maybe books that have had an impact on your life that you think others should read or or even things you've read recently Ivan Chenard's you know let my people go surfing if you want to read a book maybe just one book about the culture of a company and how that can really not only have influence on the outside to the outside world but the inside in the inside world of that company, your company, I think I would definitely read that. And yeah. I think the clue is always in books that you read that you give away and go to friends, go, hey, you should read this. Yeah, my old boss, Paul Arden, wrote a book, you know, and it's, you know, it's not how good you are, it's how good um, you want to be. And I think that's, you know, a little bit of genius. I mean, he was, uh, you know, like one piece of luck is having a great boss. I mean, you know, like you should always choose your bosses very carefully because ultimately they're going to push you hard when you need to be pushed hard. And, and Paul's book is genius and he was a genius and I was very lucky to work for, under him for, I don't know, seven, eight years. Your books, obviously. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I would go and check out all the do book company books. Actually, like she's on fire. I mean, that, that book company's doing really well. Bless her. I mean, another book, actually, he spoke at the Do Lectures as well, and uh, that's Ryan Holiday, and it's all about the ego. And I thought that was a really amazing book because actually, for me, one of the biggest things is building a team, and you have to kill the ego. You, you can't build a team, like, you, know, you can't lead a group of people if they don't want you to lead them. And sometimes you, you think it's all about you, and, and it actually building a team isn't about you at all. It's like being a leader is being there to serve everybody else. And I think people you know, make that mistake where because you have a lot of charisma and you, you can do YouTube or whatever, you go, actually, being a leader is how can you serve these people? And actually, you know, so Ryan's book on, on uh, ego is a really great one. Again, I've bought that and given that to lots of people. Well, David, thank you very much indeed for the book recommendations and your time on the podcast today. Take care. Cheers. All this information and more can be found at dominicmonkhouse.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find show notes, additional reading and links related to this episode. You can also find my blog and the past editions of the Melting Pot newsletter. The simplest thing to do is to sign up to my subjectively, not crap, 
once a week newsletter, where I'll update you on what I've been up to, the most interesting articles I've read, and all things relating to scaling up, high-performing teams, net promoter score, company culture, etc. Social, you can find me on Twitter at Dom Monkhouse and LinkedIn at Dominic Monkhouse. LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me and share your questions and comments. Thanks for listening.